Thank you for what I hope was a kind and overly generous introduction. It would have been nice to have been there in person today. You've got a great lineup, many provocative speakers, and I tip my hat to the IPA for hosting such an event. Unfortunately, your Boris Johnson didn't approve my visa application in time. It's getting really confusing to know who to send these things to now. Um, I'm sure your government will clear it up quickly, but for today, it's me via video. Um, my topic today is win without pitching. Uh, I've been an advisor to creative firms on business development issues for 15 years or so, and across those years, I've heard free pitching referred to variously as the advertising disease by designers, and I've heard it referred to on the European continent, you remember those guys, right? As the English disease. So if free pitching is the English advertising disease, then that would make you patient zero. Now, the truth is it was more likely that um, free pitching was born on Madison Avenue, and I'm not here to sign blame. Um, some probably see the term disease as overly harsh. I personally don't see free pitching as a problem, but rather the symptom of a collection of problems that we've convened here to discuss, some of us via video. So some of you are thinking, well, we pitch, we win some, we lose some. That's just the way it is. Where's the problem? And some of you I know from experience are thinking, well, win without pitching. Nice theory, but I know it never happens in reality. Well, it does happen in reality, although I will admit that the larger the firm, the larger the client, and the closer either of you are to either New York City or London, the more highly ingrained the bad practices are, and that's on both the client side and the agency side. But the principles I'm going to talk about today, they apply regardless of the size or location of your firm or of that of the client. So today's question is, how do you win without pitching? How can a creative firm win new business without first giving away its most valuable offering for free? That's a question I have over 30,000 hours invested in trying to answer, but it's a question that's tied to many related issues of cost of sale, profit margin, respect from the client, and ultimately the ability for you to do your best work for and deliver the most value to the client. So it's a big question, it's connected to many issues, and in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give you the shortest answer I can by distilling winning without pitching down into two steps. The first step to winning without pitching is to gain power in the buy-sell relationship. And the second step is to leverage that power to change how your services are bought and sold. Now, I'll speak for just a couple of minutes on the first step. I really wanna focus on the specifics and the value of the second today. This isn't meant to be a talk on the first one, but we do need to cover it. So the first step, power, power, who has the power? In your relationships with your clients before you're hired, who has the most power in that relationship? Is it you or the client? Now, it's almost always the client. I think we can all agree on that. And we can measure this. It's the client who dictates the terms of the selection process, right? It's the client who lines you up against your peers and demands you solve his problem as proof of your ability to solve his problem. It's the client who dictates pricing and it's the client who passes most of the cost of this selection process onto you. And that's really the ultimate indicator of power in the buy-sell relationship. Who bears the costs? The party with the least power bears most of the costs. Okay, um, the next question is, what is the source of the client's power? Now, if I were there in person, the first answer we would get from the audience is almost certainly to be money. The client's checkbook is at the root of his power. While that's almost always the first answer, it's incorrect. It's not the client's money, but his options that give him power. It's the availability of substitutes or the alternatives that he believes he has to hire in your firm. The client has the power to impose an arduous, often ridiculous selection process onto you to dictate pricing and to pass all of the costs onto you. And if you don't wanna participate on these terms, that's okay because there are four or five or 45 or maybe even 45 other firms just like yours who will. Oversupply is at the source of his power, the root of the free pitching problem and of many other associated problems. So if readily available substitutes or oversupply are the source of the client's power and of your lack of power, how do you gain power back? The answer is you reduce or eliminate these substitutes. And how do you do that? Through fundamental business strategy, which according to one of the world's leading authorities on the subject, Harvard Business School professor, Michael Porter, strategy is the answer to the question, how are we going to become and remain unique?
Now, what most of the business world calls strategy, we call positioning. So you gain power through effectively positioning your firm to be seen as having far fewer direct competitors. I'm not going down the positioning rabbit hole today except to say this one thing. Those that are adamant that they can never win without a pitch have never truly been in that position of power where you realize in the client's eyes that you are his only hope. In that rare ideal moment where you see clearly that you are his best option, he sees it and you see that he sees it, if you could leverage that power in that moment, you would almost certainly succeed. And that brings us to our second step, the leveraging of what power you do have to drive down your cost of sale, protect your margins, and maintain the all-important expert practitioner position in the relationship. Instead of being relegated to vendor, and thereby preserving your ability to do your best work. I'd like to share with you my four priorities for winning new business. The first is to win without pitching, to try to win the business before it gets to a competitive situation, before you're lined up against your peers and asked to solve the client's problem as proof of your ability to solve his problem. This is the ideal, rare air breathed by expert firms only, and for many of them only rarely. Now, if you cannot win without pitching, and many cannot, the second priority is to try to derail the pitch, to get the client to put their arduous, often ridiculous selection process aside and take an alternative next step with you. The best new business development people that I know excel right here. Their strength isn't in building decks or in commanding a room, it's in getting the client to see their situation differently, in the sale before any pitch. It's in getting them to agree to throw out their brief and go with the agency as they explore different solutions to a different problem. This is the most fun you can have in new business development. Now the third priority, if you cannot win without pitching and you cannot derail the pitch, is to try to gain the inside track, to gain a competitive advantage, to get behavioral concessions granted to you that show, that prove the client sees you as meaningfully different. These are the games that you play. If you're going to pitch, this is where you do it with a client who grants these concessions to you. The concessions are vital because I can prove to you and will shortly that they, uh, they predict a dramatic increase in your likelihood of winning the business. More on this in a couple of minutes. The fourth priority, if you cannot do any of the previous three, is to walk away. Because if you cannot accomplish any of the above, your odds of winning are about one over two N with N being the number of firms under consideration. Now, why is that? Why are the odds not a more straightforward one over N? Because someone almost always has the inside track. They're being treated differently. They have inside information. They have someone actively lobbying for them on the inside. Or in some situations, as you know, the outcome is already predetermined. If I asked you, have you ever won or lost business when the fix was in? where you had assurances that the account was yours and you just had to go through the motions to satisfy procurement, or where you strongly suspected that your competitor won with the same assurances, how many of you would raise your hand? All of you would. All of you but the beautifully naive, right? This happens all the time. This is the strongest form of the third priority, gaining the inside track. If you don't have the inside track, you have to assume that someone else does because your odds of winning are bleak. Let's look at them. In 2015, I participated in a larger survey on agency new business development conducted by RSW US that measured many aspects and attitudes of new business across hundreds of firms. Now, I submitted two questions. The first was this. Thinking of the most recent new business development opportunity that you lost, to what extent did you affect the buying process? Now, here are the answers. While you're looking at those, the second question was this, thinking of the most recent new business development opportunity that you won, to what extent did you affect the buying process? Let's look at these answers. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, what do the answers to the, these two questions tell us? First, on the left-hand side, the likelihood of an agency winning without affecting the buying process is only about one in eight. On the far right-hand side, on the other hand, a firm that significantly affects the buying process loses only 4% of the time. That's astounding. Now, moving to the middle, just by somewhat affecting the buying process, your odds of winning move from about one in eight to better than one in two. So, if you do not affect the buying process, you can still win about 12% of the time on average. If you somewhat affect the buying process, you're more likely to win than not, 
And if you significantly affect the buying process, you're all but certain to win. Now, granted, these two questions are a bit of a blunt instrument. They're not showing cause, but a strong correlation between pushing back on the client's buying process and winning the business. It appears that in more than four out of five opportunities, the actions of the agency are at worst showing a strong prediction of the outcome and at best possibly even impacting that outcome. So if you cannot win without pitching and if you cannot derail the pitch altogether, then you should be working to push back on the client selection process and get behavioral concessions granted to you, such as access to decision makers, concessions in the process, concessions in your response to required submissions, changes in date, location, and other variables of all different kinds, because the client's willingness to grant you these concessions is a sign of how meaningfully different they see you to be. They are predictors of your likelihood of winning and therefore indicators of whether or not you should proceed. More on that in a few minutes. I'll say again, the best business development people are not those with the best contacts or who craft the best decks, or those who can command a room. No, the very best do their best work well before it ever gets to this idea of two parties sitting formally on opposite sides of the table with the show about to begin. The magic, the real magic of new business happens before this show, and in some cases, it renders the show unnecessary. Now, these findings are further supported by the more rigorous research underpinning the 2011 book, The Challenger Sale, by authors Matt Dixon and Brent Adamson. In their research, the authors and their organization, the Corporate Executive Board, endeavored to determine if any of the five distinct profiles of salespeople delivers a consistently higher performance across all business-to-business -business categories. Their hypothesis was that the relationship builder, someone who builds personal and professional relationships and works to resolve tensions in the sale, would win. What they found, though, is the opposite. While well, 26% of all B2B salespeople meet this relationship builder profile, only 7% of top performers do. Challengers, on the other hand, those who push back on the client's ideas of their problem, solutions, and buying process, represent about the same percentage of the general B2B salesperson population, 23% compared to 26%, but they contribute 39% of the top performers. Relationship builders acquiesce to the client's perspective on the problem, the form of the solution, and their preferred way of hiring an advertising agency. Remember, these people seek to, to uh, resolve tension. Challengers don't acquiesce on any of these points. If they think something is wrong, they say it. If they think there's a better way to move forward, they suggest it. They're comfortable building tension as they examine and push back on all of these things. Now, these numbers are across all B2B salespeople, but things get even more compelling as the complexity of the sale increases. In high complexity sales, so that's you selling expensive abstract ideas for large business challenges. In these high complexity sales, the challenger makes up more than 50% of all top performers and the relationship builder just 4%. In these complex B2B sales, challengers outperform everybody by a long shot, and they outperform relationship builders in particular by a ratio that is, get this, greater than 13 to 1. I say again, the best business development people are not those with the best contacts, the best decks, or the best command of a room. The best are those who push back on the client's flawed thinking on their problem, their solutions, and their selection process. The most successful are these challengers working for well-positioned, highly differentiated firms. Their power comes from working for a firm that's seen as meaningfully different, and their own motivational makeup makes it easy for them to naturally try to leverage this power. So these people have power, naturally seek to leverage it, and tend to win more. Their competitors choose to put their resources into the deck and the pitch, happy to play the numbers game. All right. I want to sum all this up by talking about what I call Blair's game theory of alternative business development strategy, in which we discuss the fact that most firms still will not employ this approach, but all can learn something from it. So in an environment of multiple zero-sum competitions, that means lots of pitches in which the winner takes all and there's no prize for second place, right? The primary strategy employed by most firms is to play the numbers game, to enter as many competitions as they can, to try their hardest and win their share. So, 
enter 16 pitches in a year with an average of four firms per pitch and with all things reverting to the mean over time, you should win four on average, right? That's the straightforward math driving most firms who view the playing field as relatively fair and who believe their odds of winning to be one over n. Now, the alternative strategy, the win without pitching strategy, is to enter as many competitions and uh, immediately see if you can get the rules changed in your favor. If you can affect the buying process by getting the client to view their problem differently or by getting them to make significant concessions to you that they don't make to other firms, then these are the games that you play. If you cannot gain such an inside advantage, then you leave the game and you go on to the next one where you once again See if you can change things in your favor. It's kind of like the best blackjack players who fold, fold, fold while waiting for a hand where they know the odds are good. While the amateur sits there betting smaller amounts more frequently, using more subjective criteria to routinely overestimate his odds of winning. Now, this alternative strategy is not really available to everyone, is it? The undifferentiated generalist firm and the relationship builder individual struggle with this approach. I'm not trying to discredit the volume approach. I'm simply saying that there is another way. Firms that are more specialized and individuals who identify with this challenger profile would do well to pursue this, uh, pursue this alternative strategy. The mistake is to look to the larger firms, those that you in some ways aspire to be, and think that because they pursue the volume strategy that you should too, and that's just not so. To recap, there are two steps to winning without pitching. The first is to gain power through positioning, and the second is to leverage that power by pushing back on the client's problem, solutions, and procurement process. The four priorities of winning new business are to first win without pitching if possible. If not, then to try to derail the pitch altogether by suggesting an alternative next step. Now, that's usually a phased engagement, and sometimes it's coupled with some sort of guarantee on the first phase. If you cannot derail the pitch, the third priority is to try to gain a competitive advantage. You want the client to treat you differently than they're treating your competitors because at worst, it's proof that they see you as meaningfully different, thereby indicating that you should proceed. And at best, pushing back actually causes them to think about you differently, almost always because you've caused them to think about their own problem differently. The fourth priority, if you can't accomplish any of the above, is to walk away and go play another game. Now, some of you I know are gonna have a real hard time with this um, for uh, a variety of possible reasons. Maybe you're not getting invited to too many pitches these days and you feel you can't afford to be choosy, or maybe the ownership group above you just would not stand for such heresy. Maybe you're still young and unjaded and love the drama and the late nights of the pitch. All right, continuing with my recap, our research indicates that if you do not push back and affect the buying process, your odds of winning are about one in eight. If you moderately affect the buying process, your odds improve to better than one in two. And if you significantly affect the buying process, you will win more than nine times out of 10. That's an astounding number. All these numbers are further supported by the research underpinning, underpinning the challenger sale that says, in a complex B2B sale, the challenger salesperson, someone who endeavors to do all of these things, this person outperforms all other salesperson profiles by some distance. Now, I've painted a picture of two strategies, a primary strategy that you might call volume and an alternative strategy that you might call control. Even if you're employing the volume strategy, you should still be pushing back where it makes sense to do so, so that you can determine which opportunities make sense for you to apply the most resources against. The greater the concessions you get from the client, the bigger the bet in terms of time, money, and other resources it makes sense for you to make on that client. So in closing, it's not the polite, compliant rule followers who are most likely to win. It's the ones who push back and challenge the client's assumptions, errors, and sometimes their quite ridiculous selection process or requirements. Now, many of us think of new business development as a game, and why not? It should be fun, right? But we don't all agree on the name of the game. To me, the name of the game is this. It's the polite battle for control. 
If you can gain some control in the buying cycle via concessions to the process or concessions that the real problem isn't as the client initially laid it out in the brief, then you improve your likelihood of winning. If you cannot get this control, you move on looking for the next game. You preserve your integrity, your positioning as the expert, and you reserve the right to do business with this client at some point in the future. In business, in nature, and in life, there's always an alternative strategy. So I wanna thank you for indulging me and listening to mine. I'll now take your questions. Just kidding, it's video, there will be no questions. Enjoy the rest of the conference. You can find me at winwithoutpitching.com. I'm Blair Enns.